Hey, Mission Hills, I am really just delighted to be able to introduce you to our guest speaker for today. His name is Robert Watson. He's the teaching pastor at Sun Valley Community Church in Phoenix, Arizona, which is one of the churches that we look to uh, to learn from. Their lead pastor, Chad Moore, is a great friend of mine, and I'm a little jealous of Chad because he has Robert as his teaching pastor, and Robert is a fantastic communicator, and I am so excited to have him with us today. So would you welcome to the stage Robert Watson. Well, thank you, Mission Hills. It's a huge honor for me to be here with you this weekend. Like Craig mentioned, I'm a pastor from Arizona. I've been at the church that I'm at for the last 20 years and absolutely love what I get to do in sharing God's word. And so I'm excited to be sharing God's word with you today. A little bit about me. I met my wife on a mission trip, actually, to Africa. And we have three kids. I have a picture of my family here. So that's my wife, Lindsay, next to me. On the right, that's our oldest, Gabriel. He is 16, just got his driver's license. Corbin's in the middle. He's 14. And Emma, just yesterday, turned 13, which means I have three teenagers at home. So when Craig asked if I wanted to come to Denver for the weekend, (laughs) I said, yes, I would love to come to Denver for the weekend. But I had no idea when I left Arizona, it was like 75 degrees. And as the plane is coming into Denver, I'm looking out the window thinking, what have I done? It's, it's cold here. There's snow on the ground, which I guess I could have prepared for that and looked ahead. But uh, I am excited to be here. And we're going to be talking about Flesh and Blood Encounters, continuing this series. And we're going to talk about some things that are a little bit, a little bit heavy, a little bit difficult today. Uh, for me as a parent, the times that I suffer the most, it's when my kids are struggling, when my kids are rebelling or when, they're, or when they are suffering. If you are an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent or a parent or a big brother or a big sister, you understand that sometimes when those who we love that, that are, are younger, when they're suffering, we also are suffering with them. And we're going to look at an encounter that Jesus has with a woman who is suffering. She's not personally suffering. She's suffering because her daughter is suffering. And we're going to learn about what does it look like for us to walk with God, to trust God in those kinds of moments. A couple months ago, I received a phone call from one of our staff members that their daughter was in the hospital. And what had happened, their daughter was born prematurely, and so she had spent her first few weeks in the hospital already, and now she was a couple months old. She was at home, and there was just sickness going around. She caught a cold, so they went to the ER, and the ER doctor said, yeah, it's, it's not great. Maybe she'll just you know, be able to work it out at home, but if you want, you might want to have the children's hospital take a look at her. And you can drive her there yourself, or if you want, we can arrange transport. So for whatever reason, they said, let's arrange transport. So they put this little baby in the ambulance, and they start driving. Mom's there. The EMT is there. And just about three minutes into the car drive, the the child stopped breathing. And, And she coded right there in the ambulance. And so the EMT signals to the driver, we need to turn around and go back to the hospital where a helicopter was waiting, where they would take her, her baby this newborn girl, and put her on a helicopter and fly her to the children's hospital. And mom had to then drive about 45 minutes to catch up. And I got the phone call, and they were just absolutely devastated and in total shock. And if ever you've gone through something like that, that that feeling of of just everything else in the world just disappears, and you're just just in this state of shock. And so we began to pray. And, And as many people as we could contact, we said, hey, be praying for baby Kensington. This is what's going on. Be praying for the the baby, and my wife and I that night, we prayed, and, and I'm not an emotional person. Like, when, when I have emotions, they live deep down inside of me, and every now and then they show up on the surface. As my wife and I were praying that night, I was just bawling, just tears streaming down my face. And for me, it was just this picture of, of this innocence and the brokenness of this world colliding together in this one moment. And it's just heartbreaking and, and gut-wrenching. And so we're praying and went to the hospital the next day with another one of our pastors and there we're praying with mom and dad. And the hardest thing in all of this is she's on a ventilator. They have machines keeping her alive. She's sedated. Mom and dad weren't allowed to touch her because when they did, it would agitate her. And that that little tiny ventilator could puncture the inside of her lungs. And so they had to just stand back. That's all they could do. So we prayed together. And I remember looking down as we're praying and as we're huddled up with our eyes open, I'm looking at the ground and I'm just seeing tears soaking the carpet of the hospital. 
such a hard feeling when your kids are suffering or again, if you're a big brother, big sister, aunt, uncle, teacher, and there's kids who are suffering. Today we're gonna see how Jesus interacts with somebody who's suffering because their kid is suffering. And there's different types. Sometimes suffering is physical. Sometimes it's relational. Sometimes it's spiritual. Sometimes it's psychological. But when it's beyond our control, there's a desperation that comes with that. We're going to be in Mark chapter 7. If you have your Bible, you can open it up there. Starting in verse 24. And it says this, Jesus left that place, so he's doing ministry in one region, he's moving to another region. He left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre, which is modern day Lebanon. So he leaves kind of the area of Israel and he goes to this kind of foreign land where it was known that this is a a pagan land. These are Gentiles who worship false gods and so they're going to that region on purpose. He entered a house and yet did not want anybody to know it. So Jesus isn't making a big deal of it. He already has lots of opposition. He's not wanting more opposition about, oh, now he's leaving Israel to go minister to these Gentiles, but he's going there intentionally. It says, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. Jesus leaves Israel, intentionally goes to this pagan Gentile region, and he encounters this mom who is suffering. Now, suffering can come from lots of different places. Sometimes people won't put their trust in God because they look at the suffering of the world, or they look at the suffering of their own life, and it's a barrier to faith for them, where they go, okay, if God is all-powerful and God is all-good, then why is there suffering in the world? And so it's important that we have a, a decent theology of suffering to understand we suffer because of sin. In fact, suffering comes, sometimes it's from our own decisions. We make choices, and those choices have consequences, and we suffer the consequences of the decisions that we've made. Sometimes suffering comes not because of something we've decided, but because of something somebody else has decided. Somebody spoke words to you that that were hurtful. It could be a loved one, a parent didn't say the words that they should have said to you, but they're proud of you, that they love you, and so we suffer the loss of what they didn't do. Sometimes their actions have a ripple into our lives. That's how That's how life works. Sometimes we suffer because of others' decisions, and sometimes suffering is totally random. And it's a symptom of living in a broken world. To give a quick theology of the Bible, God creates Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and everything is very good. There is no suffering in that state, yet Adam and Eve chose to rebel against God. They were given dominion over all of creation, so not only did it their decision affect them and each other, it affected all of creation, and now all of creation suffers. And we have things like natural disasters and disease, sickness, snow on the ground when you fly into Denver. (laughs) I know you guys are acclimated to the cold. I am not acclimated to the cold. I think it's a result of sin. (laughs) And I totally agree with you when you come to Arizona in the summer, that also is the result of sin, okay? There's... There's things that are affected in creation that that things are not as they should be. And so sometimes the suffering, you can't pinpoint exactly where the cause is because it's random. It's because we're in a broken world. Yet our natural response, when things are going really good in life, we go, man, yeah, well, I worked hard and, and I've done certain things. And so when things are good, I tend to take credit. And as soon as things go bad, I go, God, what are you doing? You ever notice that? When things are good, we take credit. When things are bad, we give God blame. It should be the other way around. When things are bad, it's because there's suffering in this world. It's it's ultimately caused by sin. When things are good, it's because of the grace of God. If I could take the theology of the Bible and sum it up, when it comes to suffering, ultimately, suffering is caused by sin, but it's used by God. And God, in his sovereignty and in his goodness, he can use our suffering for our good. How does he do that? A few different ways. One of the things that suffering does is suffering focuses us. It gets our attention. I mean, think with me. Think think about those moments that suffering has just unexpectedly shown up in your life because I know that everybody in this room, we've been affected by suffering in some way, in some capacity. There were things that seemed really, really important that day, and then you got a phone call. There were things that in life that we were chasing after, chasing after, and then the relationship fell apart when we realized all those things we were chasing after weren't as important as that relationship. 
my schedule is super busy, and then I get a phone call that my dad has a brain tumor. I get another phone call that my, my stepbrother has brain cancer, that my child is in the hospital. Those moments that I get those phone calls, things that seem really important all of a sudden don't matter anymore. You ever notice this? It's like the wind of suffering just blows away everything that's on the surface, and we're left at the core of what actually matters most in life. And in the end, all that matters is God and people. That's why Jesus said, if you want to understand the most important commandment in all the Bible, it's love God with all your heart. He says, and it's love your neighbor as yourself. It's love God, love people. All the law, all the prophets hang on these two commandments. It's all about God and people. That's what matters most in life. Suffering focuses our attention. C.S. Lewis writes that God will whisper to us through our pleasure, but he shouts through our pain. There's a clarity that comes through suffering. Suffering focuses. Suffering also reveals. Suffering reveals. You may have noticed that I have a fruit basket up here. If you didn't, pay more attention in church. We're going to do a little cooking with Robert portion of the message right now. I have in my hand here a sliced orange. If I place that sliced orange inside this and I begin to squeeze it, what comes out of the orange? Think about it. Orange juice. You guys are so smart. Somebody, somebody whispered it in the front row. You get a gold star today. Orange juice comes out. Why? Because that's what's on the inside. It's not a trick here. If I take a lemon, see how you do on this one. If I take a lemon and I put it in the same thing and I, I, I begin to squeeze it, what comes out of the lemon? Lemon juice. All right, you guys are getting it. You're getting it. If I take a lime, same thing. I put the lime in there. I squeeze the lime. What comes out? Lime juice. Girl in the front row. Gold star. Good job. Now, here's where it gets real tricky. If I were to take a lemon and hide it under an orange peel. So when you look at it, you go, well, that looks like an orange, but you know that it's a lemon inside. If I were to take that, and if I were to put that into this squeezer, and I were to begin to squeeze it, what's going to come out? I actually tricked somebody on that one. <laughs> lemon juice. Because that's what's on the inside. Even if on the outside it looks like an orange, what's on the inside, when you squeeze it, that's what shows up on the outside. When you and I go through suffering, here's what happens. Life is beginning to squeeze us. And whatever is on the inside, whatever we believe, whatever is our focus, whatever is our, our object of worship begins to be revealed in those moments that we experience suffering. And sometimes we think, I have great faith in God, I trust God, I believe in God, and then we go through suffering and it begins to squeeze us and we go, oh, God must not be real. And what's revealed, what's on the inside that gets revealed in those moments is that our faith was in a God that didn't actually exist. Our faith was in a God who we made up, not the God of the Bible. It was a God who in our minds, his job is just to make sure that life is always easy, that we never face any difficulty, that it's only just smooth sailing because I put my trust in him. Just so you know, that is not the God of the Bible. Bible teaches that God's children will suffer. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. But to take heart, be courageous. Take heart, because I have overcome the world, he says. God's children suffer. Jesus suffered. And whatever's going on on the inside, you can fake it when things are good, but when you go through the trial, when you go through the challenge, whatever's on the inside is now going to be revealed and you decide, is that truly faith in God? Or am I trusting in a God who doesn't exist? Suffering reveals what's going on on the inside. There's this moment, you mentioned it earlier in the service, where Jesus is praying and he, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's about to go to the cross and he is suffering the agony of anticipation. He knows what he's about to endure on the cross. And at the Garden of Gethsemane, it's on the Mount of Olives, he can see the place where he's going to be put on trial, where he's going to be beaten, and ultimately where he's going to be taken to be crucified. And there he's praying. He brings disciples. They keep falling asleep, but he's praying, and he's, he's so in anguish, it says his sweat was like drops of blood. And he's there, and he's praying, and he's crying out to God as he's 
being pressed. By the way, Gethsemane means olive press. On the Mount of Olives, this was the place where the olives would be pressed and the olive oil would come out. And there, Jesus is experiencing this pressing of suffering. And he's crying out to God, Father, if there's any way for this cup to be taken, if there's any other way that we can do the salvation thing, if there's any other path to that, let's do that. But not my will, your will be done. What comes out is obedience to the Father. What comes out is love for you and for me. What's on the inside is revealed in that moment that Jesus is suffering. What's on the inside is made evident. The third thing is that suffering shapes. Suffering shapes, transforms us, makes us different. You will not go through suffering and be the same person on the other side of it that you were before you entered into it. James writes this, and if you're in suffering right now, you're going to go, I don't know if I believe this. I don't know if I'm feeling this right now. But James writes this. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Why? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking Anything. Do you want to grow in faith? Do you want to grow in perseverance? Do you want to grow in maturity? That happens through suffering. Suffering will change you. But not necessarily for the good. You decide. You decide. You can choose as you're going through, you're going through that press whether you like it or not. That squeezing is happening whether you like it or not. But you can choose to grow through whatever it is you are going through. How do you do that? by choosing to walk with God through the suffering. A lot of people, when things get difficult, they push God away. They go, things are just so hard, so God must not be good, so I'm gonna push God away. No, you choose to walk with God through suffering. Listen, he suffered. He knows what suffering is. He took suffering upon himself that you and I cannot even fathom when he went to the cross. When he took the wrath and the punishment that we deserve for our sin, he suffered in a way that we can't even begin to understand. He understands suffering. The Bible says he draws near to the brokenhearted, that that he wants to walk with us through the suffering. And when we do that, he'll grow us in ways otherwise impossible. If you want to know God more, which if I were to survey us, how many of you want to know God more? There'd be a lot of us like, yeah, I want to know God more. Do you want to know yourself more? Do you want to know really what's going on on the inside? A lot of us would say, yeah, I want to know more about myself. Do you want to have compassion for people? More, more compassion for people around you. Most of us would say, yeah, I want that. I want more compassion for people. You get those things by going through suffering. If we could take a timeline of your life right now and just kind of stretch it out in front of us. And look at what are the milestones of your journey? What are those moments that that you really grew the most? What are those moments that your faith in God really grew the most? My guess is it wasn't while you were on vacation. Probably didn't happen there. It happened through suffering. It's not on the mountaintops. I love the view this morning when I woke up and I could see the, the Rockies. And you could see these huge peaks and then these deep valleys But the bottom line is we don't grow on the mountaintops like we do in the valleys. If you want to grow in your understanding of God, your understanding of yourself, compassion for others, that happens by walking through the valley with God. When I talk to kids or students who their parents are going through a divorce, I have great compassion for those kids because I was a kid whose parents went through a divorce and rocked my world. Those who have been abused, I was abused when I was a kid, and so I have great compassion for those who suffer abuse. I've dealt with anxiety, and so those who have anxiety, if you haven't had anxiety, you're like, what? what's everybody making such a big deal about? If you walk through that, you have compassion for those who are going through that. In my marriage, my wife and I, we've had to work through some difficult things and, and work through conflict and get to the other side of that conflict, and there's hard conversations, and it takes work, and it takes courage. I have compassion for those that are doing that work and working through and protecting and building and Saving their marriage. I used to think people with chronic pain were a bunch of sissies. 
And people, I, I talk to people, hey, what's going on? Oh, my, my back hurts. Can you pray for that? Yeah, I'll pray for that next time. Hey, what's going on? Oh, my back hurts. I'm like, you know what? I want to stop praying for that. Like, just stop. Just get better. Or like, just quit complaining. Like, just toughen up, you know? Until I started having chronic back pain. And having issues and having to go to specialists and, and get shots and different things like that. And eventually, I just recently, a few months ago, I had to have surgery on my, on my back. And until I went through that, I didn't have compassion for people with chronic pain. Now, if you're dealing with chronic pain, oh man, I have so much compassion for you. It's exhausting when each and every day you wake up to the same thing over and over with no reprieve. I get that. There are things that you are compassionate towards others because of the suffering you've endured. God will use that to shape us, to help love a world, because the world outside of this place, they also are suffering, and when we've gone through suffering, we have compassion for those who aren't yet here. We understand the, the pain that they're going through. Some of us, we've suffered our whole lives without knowing Jesus, and recently somebody invited us to church, and we started following Jesus, and now we have compassion for those who are far from Jesus, because they don't know what they're missing. Suffering will shape you. Suffering will transform you if you allow God to do it. So we're sitting there in the hospital praying for this, this baby, Kensington. We prayed and we cried and we prayed and it was so hard for them not to be able to hold their baby, but we started sending in, you know, the messages of the prayers and they would just hold it over her. And the next day I got a call and said, you're not going to believe what happened last night. Her ventilator came loose. Even though nobody, she was sedated, nobody was touching her, the ventilator came loose. So the doctors and nurses all come rushing in and, and they're pulling it out and they're, they're putting a new one in and as they're putting the new one in, they realize that her, her little lungs are moving on their own. So they keep the ventilator out and they're monitoring her and they, they start to wean her off of sedation. And she opens up her eyes, look at, looks around and she starts smiling. In fact, that next day, I, I got this picture sent to me. This is baby Kensington the next day. That's mom's hand for the size comparison. She's itty bitty. And I believe that night, God did a miracle in those tiny little lungs. And God, who is the author of life, who first breathed life into the lungs of Adam, I believe God breathed life into her tiny little lungs. But man, walking through that journey, yeah, we can praise God for that. So difficult, so hard, so painful for parents that are going through something like that. And God heals, but he heals differently in different ways. Sometimes he doesn't heal the way we want him to. Sometimes we pray for something and we don't have that, that same result. God heals a few different ways. God does heal medicinally. If you're like, oh, well, I went to a doctor and I was healed. You can praise God for that. All of you who work in the medical field, thank you for your ministry. You guys are working alongside God. God is the great healer, but God has given us medicine. He's given us science. The reason we can even know the things that we know about the human body is because he's created an order to things that we can measure, we can study, we can experiment, we can learn about the creation that God has entrusted to us. And so we have science and we have medicine. That's, that's no less something to praise God for. God heals medicinally. God also heals miraculously. My favorite thing in the world is when doctors are totally confused. They're like, we have no idea how this happened. We have no idea. This doesn't make any sense. I've been doing this for, you know, 40 years, 50 years. I've never seen anything like this. I love those stories. Like, yeah, God did something. Sometimes God heals eternally. He doesn't heal the way we want him to heal. He doesn't heal in this life. We pray for healing, and he gives it to us, but maybe not in the way that we want, but in the way that we need. But God is a God who heals, and when we suffer, we, we lean into him. We trust him. We don't push away. We go, okay, God, we know you can heal. You can heal a variety of different ways. And so, God, we're going to trust you. We don't know how in this account that we've been looking at, how this, this daughter came to be possessed by an impure spirit, but we do know God is going to use it for good. The woman, this is the mom, was a Greek born in Syria and Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter and then Jesus says something interesting here, and it bothered me at first, and I had to study the Greek, and I had to study the context. Jesus says, first let the children eat all they want, he told her, 
For it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. I go, Jesus, what, what does that mean? What are you saying? And he's using some cultural language of the time where people would talk about the people of God, the people of Israel. These were the children of God and that the ministry of the Messiah, the Savior, was to minister first to God's people, the people of Israel. And it was commonly said that those outside of that family of God, that those were the dogs. And the, the Greek word was kuon. It meant scavenger dog. Scavenger dogs were the ones that would come out at night and rummage through the trash. And, and so that was the common language. And Jesus is using this common phrase, but he changes the word from kuon to kuarion. From scavenger dog to a house puppy, little puppy that lives in the home. And that subtle change, he takes what was the common language and he kind of he twists it. He softens it. As one theologian puts, he took the sting out of that common phrase. And to understand this, I, I need to know who's in the room here. How, how many people here in Denver, you would say you are a dog person? Raise your hand if you are a dog person. Okay, majority of the room. Uh, where are my cat people? Cat people? Okay, yep. I see you. It's okay. Everyone's welcome at Mission Hills. <laughs> Just keep, keep praying, keep reading your Bible. You'll get there. I, uh, I'm just kidding. I love you. God loves you. I'm a dog person, um, mainly because most of my family's allergic to cats. Otherwise, I'd probably be a little bit of a cat person, but I'm a dog person. In fact, I brought a picture of my dog to show you. This is Sherlock. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, I was like, oh, I'm going to send a picture of my family and a picture of my dog. I have way more pictures of my dog I had to choose from <laughs> than I do of, of my family. And so I just picked that one because I thought... It was funny. It made me laugh. Anyhow, he's way smarter than he looked in that picture. But his name's Sherlock, and he's, he's like part of the family. And we love Sherlock, but Jesus poses a question, even for a Kuarion, even for a house dog that's kind of part of the family that you love. I mean, you wouldn't neglect, you wouldn't neglect the children giving, giving their food to the dog if they didn't eat. Like, Jesus is now, he's He's speaking to the mom heart, going, you wouldn't neglect your child for the sake, even for a house dog that's, that's loved. Listen to what she says. Verse 28. Lord. I'll pause there. It seems small. It's huge. Lord. Not rabbi. Not good teacher. Not healer, Lord. Jesus had left a region where he was traveling around and he's doing these, these miracles that are drawing in crowds and he's preaching about the kingdom of God and people are going, Rabbi or teacher, or some are even questioning, are you even from God? And now here he shows up in this pagan country to this Syrophoenician woman who probably worshiped other gods her whole life, her whole childhood. She calls Jesus Lord. It's huge. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. It's brilliant what she responds with. She sees with eyes of faith. She looks at Jesus and goes, Jesus, I know there's more than enough food. I know that there's enough grace. I know there's enough power, not just for the people of Israel, not just for the children, but for everybody. What faith she has. Calls Jesus Lord, says, oh, I know, there's enough. There's more than enough. Then he told her, this is Jesus talking, for such a reply you may go, the demon has left your daughter. Jesus loves her faith. Jesus loves her humility. She went home and she found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Jesus went there on purpose. Just prior to this, Jesus refuted the idea of clean food versus unclean food. And now here he is illustrating that he refutes this idea that there's such thing as clean people, unclean people. There's just people. And the message that Jesus is delivering, why he goes, why he has this conversation, why he calls out what was culturally, they went, oh, well, they're different than us. We're the children, and that's the dogs outside of. Jesus is drawing attention to that, that held belief, and he's just absolutely refuting and destroying it. 
The message is this, Jesus is for everyone. He's for everyone. And that's great news for us. That means no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, God loves you. He has a purpose, he has a plan for your life. God loves you. In all your brokenness, God loves you. He sees you, he knows you. He knows you better than you know yourself and he loves you. What a beautiful message he delivers. Illustrated through the Syrophoenician mom. When it comes to the grace of Jesus in your life, the Bible doesn't teach that, that the good are in and the bad are out. The Bible teaches that the humble are in and the prideful are out. God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. This woman had two things. She had humility and she had faith in Jesus. Posture of the Christian faith. It's not God owes me for the work that I've done. God owes me for the things that I've done. The posture of the Christian faith is that of humility. It's not entitlement. It's humility. God, I need you. God, I can't do this on my own. I'm not good enough on my own. God, I need your help. The Bible teaches something different than religion. Where we tend to take when it comes to this problem of how do we connect with God, we turn it into religion. And and here's the problem that everybody's trying to solve. There's this gap, this separation. We feel it in our souls where there's this separation between God who created us and us. And the Bible teaches that's because of our sin, because we rebelled against God. And so what religion is, okay, so, so then what are the steps? What's the advice on the things I have to do to try and work my way back to God? And every faith on the planet has some form of advice. Some would say, well, you have to do this to get to enlightenment or get to whatever. But it's all advice. Here are the steps you have to take. And the reason there's this gap there, well, God is just. He can't just ignore sin. He's holy. Why doesn't he just destroy sin? Because to destroy sin would be to destroy all of us because sin is a part of who we are. Yet God loves us, so there's this tension between God's love and God's justice. And where religion fails, where we can't work our way to God, the Bible teaches something called the gospel. Gospel means good news, not good advice, not good 10 steps to work your way to God, good news. And news is something you don't have to achieve, you believe and you receive it. And the good news is this, when you and I couldn't work our way to God, Bible teaches we are dead in our sin and our trespasses. A dead person can do nothing. We are just stuck here. When you and I couldn't work our way to God, God, in love, in mercy, and in grace, came to us in the person of Jesus. He lived a perfect life that you and I could never live. Never sinned, never broke any of God's law. And then he chose to lay down that life as a sacrifice in place of us, paying the penalty that you and I owed that we could never pay on our own. He paid it on the cross. He declared to tell us die, which means the debt has been paid in full. The debt of our sin was paid for on the cross. They placed his body in a tomb. On the third day, God rose him from the grave, proving that he conquered death on our behalf. He holds the keys to life. He offers life to whomever he chooses, and he chooses to offer it to anybody who would put their trust in him. We're saved by God's grace through faith. If you're here and you've not received that gift, I want to invite you to do so right now. If you want to put your trust in Jesus, Romans 10, 9 says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, just like the woman, we saw this encounter, she calls Jesus Lord. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The greatest kind of healing that exists, an eternal healing, a healing of the soul being made alive in Christ. When we pray for that, when we ask for that, the answer is yes, 100% of the time. Not because of what we've done, not because of our goodness, but because of what he's done in his goodness. If you want to say yes, would you get out your phone, just text the word Jesus to the number 80875. We want to celebrate that with you. We want to walk alongside you here in that journey of following Jesus. You can text the word Jesus to that number, 80875. And the team here will follow up with you. Not going to be weird or do anything weird. Just want to encourage you. And for the rest of us, we've been talking about suffering, and I'm not naive enough to think that in a room this size, there's not many of us who are in a season right now of we're feeling that press. 
Could be relationally something's going on. Could be physically something's going on with us or a loved one. Could be spiritually, psychologically. There's some kind of suffering going on. I want to take a moment and I want to pray specifically for you if that's you. So I'm going to ask you to do something courageous. Maybe it's going to be a little bit bold, a little bit uncomfortable, but I'm going to ask you to be courageous. If you'd like to receive prayer right now in this moment, I'm going to ask that you would just stand wherever you are in the room. Yeah, I see you. Yeah. Just stand right where you're at. Yep, all over. Yeah. A lot of us going through hard things. I see you. We see you. And I want you to know this, the most important thing in all of this, God sees you. If you hear anything today, hear this, God sees you. He knows what you're going through. The Bible says God draws near to the brokenhearted. Uh, he's with you. He knows every detail, and he wants to walk with you through whatever it is you're going through. And Mission Hills, for the rest of us, we don't ever want people to to feel like they're alone. So if you're sitting next to somebody who's standing, maybe stand with them in solidarity. If they're okay with it, maybe put a hand on a shoulder. If you can't get to the person who's standing, if you would even just reach out a hand towards them. And I know it's gonna be a little messy, but that's one of the values here. Sometimes life gets a little messy. And I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna ask if you're standing next to somebody, seated around somebody, you don't know their story, but God knows their story and you're gonna talk to God. And so you're gonna pray on their behalf as well as I pray. Would you pray with me? Father, for those who are standing all over the room, God, you know every detail of every story. I pray, Holy Spirit, even in this moment, they would sense your presence. That even though life is chaotic, that they would, they would have a deep sense of your peace. God, whatever's going on in their life, we pray for healing, in Jesus' name. We pray for relationships to be restored in Jesus' name. For children that have wandered away, that they would come back to you. Would you, Holy Spirit, draw their hearts back to faith in you? God, we never want the suffering. But as we walk through it, God, would you grow us through it? Would you strengthen us through it? God, thank you for the promise that you're not going to one day just give us consolation for the pain and the suffering we experience. You promise restoration, that you will make all things new. And until that day comes, God, we choose to trust. We cho choose to hope in the promise that if something's not good in our life, it's because you're not done. That there will be an end to suffering. There will be the wiping away of every tear. There will come a day where there is no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more pain, no more death because you are making all things new. We look forward to that day. And until that day comes, God, would you walk alongside us? We ask and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.